Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. So you've been doing some movement shopping. I have been. For a little bit of background, over the last few years, I've been wanting to make my own watches. While I would like to make my own movements from scratch, I, I'm also you know, realistic about the amount of time that I have right now and the amount of effort that's involved in making a movement from scratch. So uh, in the meantime, I've been looking at making my own line of watches using pre-purchased movements. Uh, and I've been sort of on the hunt for a watch movement that I can buy for, for quite a few years now. And how have things been going? Well, not too bad. I think my early my early movements that I, I was looking at were from um, PTS out of uh, out of Hong Kong. They they certainly had uh, a good selection of of movements. I, I've never gotten around to ordering any, so I'm not sure what the what the quality was like. And one of the reasons why I started looking around at at other places to to buy movements outside of the obvious one, which is Switzerland was because uh, Etta had decided, hmm, I guess, uh, what, what's that, about 10 years ago now, they decided they wanted to, um, to cut back on, on selling watch movements to the rest, of the, um, the rest of the industry, and they wanted to keep them internal to the Swatch group. And so while I would have been happy buying Etta movements for, for my, my watches, just like everyone else, uh, I also realized that that was coming to an end. I, I've been trying to look around for other companies to uh, to buy movements from. I guess just recently you and I had been talking about various movements that were available, and we got to talking about Eterna. Yeah, to flesh a bit of the backgrounds, uh, for those who might not be familiar, going right down to, to fundamentals, Eta makes what are essentially the, the engines of a watch. And up until just a few years ago, if you wanted to buy a reliable Swiss-made mechanical watch movement to power a watch you designed, Etta was the go-to supplier for that in Switzerland. They had a near monopoly on the market and still do to some extent, uh, even in spite of the, the cutbacks. Name a Swiss watch brand. There's a good chance that they've used Etta movements at some point in their history, at some point in their collection. I mean, Omega, Cartier, Breitling, IWC, Take Heuer, Tudor, which is owned by Rolex, and even industry stalwarts like Tech Philippe had components of their timepieces made by Etta and its offshoots like Niverox. And as you mentioned, over the course of the last decade or so, Etta has begun cutting back supply to focus on production for brands under its parent organization, which is the Swatch Group, which owns brands spanning the gamut from Swatch up to Breguet. And what I also find interesting about this turn of events, or Eterna's recent ascent as a supplier of mechanical watch movements in the void that's been left, is the fact that Eta was spun off from Eterna in the 1930s, Eta being a concatenation of Eterna. I guess the irony if you look at it that way, is that Eterna now is no longer even a Swiss-owned company. It's still a Swiss company, but the conglomerate that has come to own Eterna in recent years is actually Chinese. The year before, Eta helped usher in the Swatch Watch back in 1983, which played a pivotal role in Swiss watch brands' rebound from the quartz crisis. Eterna was, was sold, and it's changed hands a number of times over the ensuing decades, including a short period where it was owned by Porsche Design in the late 90s, until they were ultimately acquired by China Haydn Holdings in 2012. They've rebranded themselves for understandable reasons in terms of, of trying to maintain the prestige of, of a, a Swiss watch manufacturer. China Haydn is now known as City Champ Watch and Jewelry Group. Yeah, a lot of micro brands who aren't using movements that are coming out of Asia or from other small suppliers that have stepped in to fill the, the Etta void, like Salida or Soprod is another, used by microbrands like Oak and Oscar. A lot of microbrands are turning to Eterna for a good reason. They offer quite a variety of movements at a, a reasonable price point, and they are still produced in Switzerland at prices that are very comparable to what you would have been able to buy Etta movements for. One of the advantages that I found through dealing with Eterna is that they're willing to talk to someone like me who is only interested in purchasing 
watches at a small scale or watch movements at a small scale. I'm not interested in buying 200 movements uh, or 500 movements or 10,000 movements. A lot of companies were just unwilling to talk to me because I am not big enough to, to deal with. You know, for somebody like myself, where I'm interested in selling maybe a few tens of watches a year, trying to buy 100 movements at a time, uh, unless I'm willing to use the exact same movement in all of my watches for the next, you know, five or six years, it, it's, it's not necessarily practical for me to buy 100 units at a time. Just out of curiosity, when had you touched space them? Because I've gotten quotes from them for much smaller volumes than 100 pieces. Hmm, that, that's maybe something that's changed. I think the last time I, I spoke with them was maybe four years ago. If you're interested in purchasing a, a Tour de movement from them, they're willing to they're willing to sell a single Tour de Lyon at a time. Now that that's not as bad as it is with with somebody like an Eterna or an Etta, um, because even the more complex movements, you know, mechanical movements from a PTS is, you know, you're you're talking about maybe at most thirty or fifty dollars American a unit. Uh, whereas with with Eterna and Etta and and companies like that, the you know each movement is in the hundreds of dollars. It, it's a little bit more practical to buy a hundred units from PTS just because the cost per unit is so low. You know you can spend four or five thousand dollars and and have a hundred movements. Where you know from the Swiss brands, you're not getting a hundred movements for four or five thousand dollars. You know that it's sort of a an order of magnitude more expensive than that. And I would say there's an order of magnitude difference in terms of the precision of timekeeping you're going to get between the two as well. There probably is. You're right. And, and so one of the, one of the things that had kept me from buying from somebody like PTS was that even though I, I could get these movements and I could do, you know, I could use them in my watches. I knew that I was going to have to do quite a bit of work on them to, be happy with the sort of the results, the the timekeeping results that I wanted out of them. And, you know, so the question then became, did I want to buy something like that where I was putting a bunch of work into sort of rebuilding the watch so that it was going to be more accurate or spend more money and try and find something that I could, you know, that I didn't have to put as much work into to uh, to do that work. So uh, I was I was quite... F- quite happy to find uh find out that Eterna was willing to sell you know sort of sell movements at a uh in small quantities for me because as you say the uh the quality of timekeeping difference is significant uh one of the things that I like about Eterna is that their relatively recent movement the uh the the, the caliber 39 they have intentionally made a movement that is very modular and they have added a number of functions to it so you can basically decide what combination of functions you want or what combination of uh, of complications you want in this movement and then you you decide you know what you're interested in so it gives you some flexibility to make a watch that isn't necessarily identical to everybody else's watch you know it's not like buying an Etta 2824 where they're all pretty much the same. Uh, this way you can buy, you know, a basic caliber 39 and you can say, all right, well, I want this with, you know, as an automatic or I want it as a manual wind. Uh, you know, I want it with a moon phase dial on it or I don't, or I want it with a 24 hour dial for doing a, a separate time zone. So there's a, there's a number of different uh, complications that you can get from them and, uh, and sort of decide what it is that you're interested in, in a, in a movement. Two quick asides, just for anyone who might not be familiar. The Eta 2824 is sort of a, a workhorse entry-level watch movement. It was quite ubiquitous among mid-range watch brands coming out of Switzerland, and still is quite ubiquitous and actually serves as the base caliber for a lot of innovations that are coming out of, say, Tissot or, or Rado. And secondly, a complication, as you may have caught on from what Chris has been talking about, uh, is essentially just anything above and beyond pure timekeeping on a watch dial, so things like the moon phase or a date indication. From what we've been chatting about over the past couple of weeks, I believe you settled on a, a moon phase complication and GMT in a, a subdial, right? 
Yeah, there were two that I was interested in. There were there are a few things that I that I wanted um, in in a movement. Uh, the first was that I I wasn't interested in having uh, an automatic. I, I wanted it to be a manual wine. Um, so it's nice because all of the options that I have here from Eterna, they're all available in either an automatic or a, or a manual wine. So the ones that I've I've sort of settled on, they're all they're all manual wines. And as you and I have discussed, I'm not a big fan of dates on on my dials. I find that they tend to be a little bit busy, or they make the dial a bit busy. So I I wasn't necessarily interested in a date option, and that's something that a lot of movements have. You know, you have to get it with a date. Uh, so the one the two that I ended up settling on the 3911 is a uh, sort of standard time, you know, hours, minutes, seconds. And it also has a 24 hour sub dial in it. And then the other one that I ended up getting had a, you know, standard time, minutes, hours, seconds, and also has a moon phase dial on it so that I can add that, um, that moon phase on it. Is that the 3949? Uh, that's the 3955 is the one that I ended up getting. Now the 3955, it happens to have a uh, date window on it as well. And I, I've, I've ordered a, a prototype unit that, that has the date so that I can try it with and without the date hmm. to, um, to decide if I'm, if I'm interested in, uh, you know, in actually using it. So I'll make two different dials, one with a date window and one without, and I'll, I'll, you know, build them both and photograph them and, um, and and I can test both to see sort of what I like. Yeah, I'm surprised they don't offer the moon phase with a, a date hand similar to what they they have for the 3904. It'd be interesting to see the the dial side of both of those movements just to see if it's even possible to somehow combine the two. Because then you would actually be able to deliver something that none of the other micro brands are are able to deliver on. One of the problems that um, that I suspect you run into with this movement, and, and as I said, I haven't actually seen any of these in person yet, so I'm not sure sort of what some of the limitations are of them. Um, but I suspect that certain complications sort of stack on top of each other in a way that you can't combine some of these complications together. You know, I think that that's just a limitation of of the the modularity of the of the design. Now, it may be something that you know you might be able to take a sort of the standard. Uh, date complication and maybe figure out a way of you know modifying it to do something more interesting so that it's not just in in a date window so i'm curious to see what what they offer you know what sort of offered um in the base unit and then what what you can sort of do with it afterwards yeah i have a an idea i've been tinkering and and playing with in terms of of date indicators for uh, the past few years on and off just uh, coming up with little prototypes nothing of substance yet but it's been fun to experiment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen a few a few ideas lately. Uh, people things that people have done with um, with date indicators that are are certainly more interesting than your, you know your standard you know number in a window kind of thing. Also, one of the advantages that I have because I can fabricate a lot of parts myself, I have the option of sort of experimenting with uh, with that that date disc. You know, and being able to to come up with different ideas for how that date disc looks and where it is. You know, I can I don't have to keep it in the three o'clock position. I can put it somewhere else and print my own, you know, print my own date disc and not have to worry about about relying on sort of the same the same date disc that everybody else is using in the same location that everyone else is using. So I, I'm I am curious to see what what comes out of it. I, I don't know you know certainly for the first couple of watches that i make i don't know that i'm i'm too worried about about modifying the movements much from what they are now um i do know that i will be spending some serious time on refinishing them uh i don't think that they are finished to the level uh the the movements themselves i don't think they're finished to the level that i'm happy with uh, based on the photographs that I've seen and based on the reviews that I've seen from from other people who've sort of opened them up and like other watchmakers who've opened them up and looked at them, you know they are a bit rough. Uh, some of the machining is a bit uh, is a bit rough on them. Some of the pockets that they've machined out, uh, you can still see pretty heavy heavy machining marks in there. Um, they haven't done anything to you know bevel the edges of the of the plates or anything like that. 
the screws, you know, they, they didn't, you know, they're, they haven't blued the screws at all. So, you know, there, there are things like that, that I suspect I will be spending my time with the movement itself at first, at least, you know, sort of refinishing it so that it's at a higher level of finish than what it's coming out of the factory in. Um, and that, that'll be a big part of my focus at first. Yeah. Some of the components don't leave as much room as I'd, I'd like to see to be able to apply more finish. The bounce cock, for instance, is just a flat sheet of metal as opposed to what you'd normally see for a balance cock. Right. And, and one of the things that I may end up doing going forward, it depends on how how particular I get with this. Uh, one of the problems with coming at this from, from a jewelry point of view is my my OCD when it comes to finishing is is maybe higher than some people's when uh, mm. when it comes to making things like this. So depending on how you know how particular I get with the finish on it, I may end up remaking some of the parts. You know, so things like the balance cock. I'm if I'm unhappy with what's there, I may end up making my own and making something that I'm happier with. Uh, I may end up reshaping the bridges uh, and the plates a little bit to make something that's more interesting and a bit different than what's there. Uh, we'll just have to see and, and see what's available uh, or what's what's in the, the movement to begin with and what I come up with because uh, I don't want to I don't want to have a watch movement that looks the same as everybody else's and I don't want one that's um, you know that's finished at this level and I suspect that most people that are buying these are probably doing some finish work on them. I uh, I don't think that people are just taking these and dropping them into watches. I may be wrong, but uh, I, I don't think that most people are doing that. And for anyone who might be interested in seeing a little bit under the hood of these calibers, uh, Aaron Burlow did a, a nice teardown for Hodinkee a few years ago. So we'll link to that in the show notes as well. As I mentioned, I haven't had any experience with this particular caliber yet because it's quite new. I believe they didn't start releasing it until after the the china hayden acquisition yeah the, the, i think the f the earliest articles i've seen of this are maybe 2013 2014 that kind of time frame so and and even then i don't think most of the options were available so for people who don't know there there are a number of complications available so you can get it as either a manual wind or an automatic you can have a small seconds you can have a centra seconds you can have uh, a date you can have uh, a date indicated by hand, a 24-hour indication on a subdial. Uh, you can have the 24-hour indication as a center hand. Uh, you can have a chronograph. What else is in here? Moon phase. That, that's it right now. And so not all of those options were available initially when, um, when that Houdinki article was written, uh, but they've, they've slowly been adding complications to it. And I, I do know from the conversations I've had with Chris Becker at, at Eterna that there are some other things that they're working on adding in. So I expect we're going to see this, uh, this movement grow in terms of its options and, and flexibility. Yeah. It seems like a fairly solid base. Yeah, the most recent production Eterna I've worked on would be the 3030, which the company had produced to celebrate their 150th anniversary in 2006. And I found that particular caliber to almost be over-engineered in a sense, to the extent that there would be an unnecessary number of components, more points of failure, or more potential points of failure. An interesting thing about Eterna is they were one of the first, if not the first, manufacturer to use ball bearings for the oscillating weight for automatic winding. Uh, if you look at their logo, you can overlay that on the, the ball bearing system on the oscillating weight. All the circles of their logo correspond to the positions of the balls in the ball bearing system. So that's where their, their logo comes from. Uh, I just found there were an excessive number of ball bearings in the 3030. And some other mid-20th century calibers I've worked on from Eterna, you see the relationship to, say, the Eta 2892. But just the manner of construction I found was not created with serviceability in mind. Very clumsy movements to try and disassemble and, and reassemble. Not calibers that I, I would say I, I would be a big fan of. Uh, but the caliber 39 seems thought out far more holistically. Uh, it's not engineered to the level of, say, a Rolex, but it is designed more at, at that at a level where 
It's designed with mass production and a balance of serviceability in mind. So it's certainly much more serviceable than some of those prior movements that I mentioned. It's it's obviously a modern a modern design and the complications they've chosen are ones that that are popular currently. You know, they've obviously given this a lot of thought in terms of where it's going to go and and what they can do with it. So I'm I'm happy to see a company doing that and making making this available uh, out of a Swiss a Swiss company because honestly the the other Swiss companies that have been offering movements are are not offered a lot in terms of uh, sort of innovation. You know, a lot in terms of flexibility. And you just don't see that out of out of the the companies that you're buying, you know, somebody like me is buying these movements from. You know, it's great that you know that Rolex is designing this stuff in house, but of course they're they're designing it for themselves, and they're never going to you know they're never going to release that to to a small watchmaker. So unless I go out and buy, um, you know, buy other movements and and use those, I I can't you know I can't take advantage of that. Now I do know that there are people out there who who do reuse movements uh reuse older movements uh people i can think of that uh, off the top of my head that are doing that quite effectively are uh um the the struthers out of london england they're often taking old movements and refurbishing them refinishing them doing interesting things with with the movements and then um and then they go off and and build uh build very nice cases for them as well so that that's the other path to go down is is sort of using a, a vintage movement to make a small run of of watches off of. But the problem that you run into there is is just the difficulty in finding a large enough number of the same movement to be, you know, to to sort of make it worth your while to do that. Otherwise, you're constantly needing to redesign your cases to be able to handle different sized movements and. You know, maybe they they don't have the features that you want, or they they're not the quality that you want. So, it's a that's that's a bit frustrating, and especially living, you know, living in Canada, there isn't necessarily the accessibility of old movements like there is in Europe. I suspect that a lot of these movements are much easier to find in in sort of reasonable quantities if you're if you're in uh, in England or mainland uh, mainland Europe. I'd say it's a very fair perspective. Uh, they're doing remarkable things, and actually, I'll put a I'll put a link in the uh, the show notes to a great article that was uh, that was written about them a few uh, a few days ago. And uh, somebody went and visited their shop. In fact, on their website, they have a few uh, a few photos of um, watches that they've they've sort of recommissioned or movements they've recommissioned. Uh, in particular, there's an Omega here that they've um, they've gone off and and restored and rebuilt some new parts for as well as uh, completely refinished it. And it's um, a gorgeous looking movement. Now I know that they're in the process of, I know that they're in the process of designing their own in-house movement to be able to make themselves. I, I don't know if they're planning on making the entire movement themselves or if they're sending, if they intend to send some of it out to be worked on. But, and, and that's the ideal, obviously you want to be able to have your own movement, your own design, but it's also an incredible amount of work. Uh, I know they've been working on theirs for a few years. Another brand doing things similar to what the uh, Struthers are doing is the Atelier de Chronometrie out of Barcelona. Uh, they're building a lot of their pieces on a vintage Omega Caliber 266. I hope that at some point or another I can offer my own custom movement that I'm making and, you know, sort of designed from scratch and making from scratch. But I also realize that I'm a single person making watches, so... If I go that route, there's there's no way that I can I can manufacture a lot of movements like that. You know, there's a, a limit to my time and there's a limit to the number of, of watches that I can produce like that. So I do need an option like Eterna to be able to produce enough watches to be able to A have a brand that you know that, that has something more than just a single watch every year. Um, you know, and also to be able to make enough money to maintain sort of the studio and, and keep going because I uh, you know, as, as nice as it would be to make a single watch from hand, you know, by hand every year and, and sell that, I, I, you know, it's not practical in terms of a, a cost point of view to sell a watch like that and be able to, you know, sort of be able to pay my salary every year. Well, it's very common to start with a, a base caliber of some sort. I mean, Vianney Halter began with the Pazis 7001s, uh, Nomos as well started with that caliber. 
Petersbeek Marin made his first Tolbion from scratch, but his series produced pieces were based on the Edda 2824. Kerry Votilainen began with Abosh's, essentially, so his early minute repeaters or decimal repeaters are what he ultimately turned them into. Those were based on things like APs and Jezlokuts. His first series produced time only piece was based on the Pazza 260. Yeah, I mean, do you look at pretty much any small independent watchmaker and somewhere along the line, or to some extent, they, they got their start with a base caliber or inspired by. And of course, George Daniels made essentially everything from scratch, but his only series produced, or I shouldn't say that, his first series produced timepiece was based on the Omega 2500 that he, he did with Roger Smith. Uh, but it's, it's not at all uncommon in the industry to start with the base caliber. Even if all you're keeping is the gear train and the mainspring and the hairspring and the balance and the escapement and doing all the bridges and everything from scratch. You know, the, the, the difficult work has been done. There's There's been a sort of the, the movement has been engineered. There's there's a gear train there. Uh, as you said, the, the, the springs are there. And even if I decide to build new, you know, new plates, new bridges and whatnot for uh, for myself that that fit the move, you know, fit the the cases that I'm doing. Um, that that work is far more approachable than trying to build the entire thing from scratch myself. And so there's uh, and and it also gives me the opportunity to to maybe add some of my own work to it if uh, if I need to. So it's it gives me a lot of flexibility in in terms of what I want to do. So working with working with a turn has been great so far. Um, things don't go as fast as you want them to. Of course, it's not like uh, you know, going online and going to Amazon and saying, oh, hey, that looks good. I'm just going to order, you know, two of those and, and they're going to show up at my door in two days. Um, you know, there's a lot of back and forth in terms of talking about uh, which, you know, which models, you know, which uh, which movements you want, uh, which finishing you want on them, because they, they can supply them in, with different finishes already on there. Everything from a bead blast finish to various Geneva stripe combinations uh, different plating options, things like that. So there, there are various options available to you there. So there's a lot of back and forth in terms of getting getting that done. And then, of course, they don't necessarily have everything right then and there. Uh, some of these things are being made in in smaller quantities. So depending on which, which finishes you want on them, they may have to send them out to be finished or whatever. So that that's been you know it's it's been an interesting process learning how sort of learning how that works. I will say the the frustrating thing for for me is finding the other companies around that for making making other parts that I don't want to make. So for instance, finding uh, watch crystals. You know, if I want a standard sapphire watch crystal that's a, you know, that's a standard diameter, let's say, then I can find that quite easily. But the moment I get into doing something a bit different, let's say I want to do a rectangular watch or a, um, a tonneau uh, shaped watch, something like that, it then becomes difficult to find somebody who's willing to supply uh, that kind of thing in small quantities for me. So uh, same thing with watch straps. You know, there are a few people out there that are that are doing sort of high quality watch straps that I can buy in in small quantities for myself. But uh, you know, those, those sort of secondary businesses that are um, are, are a little bit challenging for uh, a small a small brand like me to find. So. That's been that's been an interesting process trying to source those kinds of things and uh, and the the search continues for some of them so yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see where it ends up and I suspect it's you know it, it's going to be a, probably a, a good twelve months before I'm I'm happy with being able to source the materials and the the parts that I'm not interested in making myself before I can sort of make a couple of these and and be able to start selling them. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, comes of this this project that you started with the, these eternal movements once you actually accept delivery of the first few yeah i i don't know what to expect in terms of you know as i said i've seen some photos of the movements uh that uh, especially that hoodinky article there were some great photos of the movements in there so I, I don't know what to expect those were also that was a few years ago i don't know if they've if they've improved their sort of mass finishing processes and uh, and if they're delivering something that you know that maybe has slightly better um, better finish surface finish from the machining i know the few photos that i've seen things like things like screws which i expect to have a, a black polish on it's not quite at what i would you know what i'm 
willing to accept for a, for a polish. So I know that there are things like that I'll need to, you know, I'll need to refinish. And as I said, I, I love the look of a, of a blued screw in my, in my watch movement. It, it adds a little bit of contrast to the, the movement. So there's things like that, that I, I know I'll have to do, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing them and being able to sort of tear them apart and see, see what makes them tick, so to speak. And, and, and how I can use them for, for what I'm doing. Uh, because obviously to begin with a large part of what I'm interested in is the, is the case design and the dial design. Uh, that's where my skill set lies right now. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm already experimenting with some design ideas right now. And I've, uh, I've printed off a few, a few movements so that I've got an idea of how large they are. I, I will say one of the nice things about working with somebody like an Eterna is that they're used to working with other companies that are manufacturing for their, their movements. And they're not just necessarily buying them as drop-in replacements, um, you know, in terms of repairing or fixing something, you know, they provide you with drawings and 3d models of their movements so that you can start working on the designs. You don't have to wait until uh, an actual prototype movement arrives. Uh, so even though I've been working with them for the past month or so, I, I've, I've been, designing my case at the same time because I've already got the the drawings and models of those movements and I know exactly what size they are and what shape they are and I know where the clearances are and the screw holes are and things like that so yeah it's it's nice working with a company like this that is that is interested in you succeeding with their movement because they want they obviously want to sell more of these and so if if you're if you're able to succeed in designing and developing a a case and 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 dial and whatnot around their movement, then then you're going to be more successful. So it's it's nice dealing with a company like that that's um, interested in helping you. Is there anything that you foresee as being a, a challenge that you're going to have to face once they actually arrive, or are you just unknown unknowns at this point? Uh, there are a few interesting challenges that I'm I'm not familiar with, and this is where my inexperience with watches comes in. You know, if you sit down and say to me, "Okay, I've got a I've got a design idea for a pen." I can quickly develop a pen design because I know the ins and outs of a pen design. I know, for instance, okay, we're going to build a fountain pen. I know how much space you need to leave in the cap for the the nib so that you're not going to damage the nib when you screw the cap on. I know how much space is needed in the barrel for the um, the cartridge converter so that you've got enough room for that that ink reservoir. So there's things like that that it's very easy for me to figure out a, a, a pen design just because I'm I've done so many pen designs now and I've been doing it for so long that it's I can quickly do that with with watches. There's so many things that I just don't know because I just haven't worked on a lot of watches. Uh, simple things like like attaching the movement to the case, uh, you know, building a you know in the case of of what I'm doing. My, my watch case is larger in diameter than the movement itself. So I have to build a, you know, a filler for that to, you know, for the movement so that it, it isn't just rattling around in there. Um, you know, so there's things like that. How do I, how do I approach that? Are there better, you know, there's going to be a better way to approach it than what I'm thinking of originally. So it's a question of experimenting with that a little bit, figuring out what works well, what doesn't work well, and, um, and also what I can make. Uh, that looks reasonable too. Uh, you know, just because I can design something uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be reasonable to make. You know, it, it may be just too challenging to make the way that I've I've thought of something. So there are a lot of challenges like that ahead, and I'm I'm some of them I know, uh, some of them I don't know, and I and I obviously haven't run into yet. So it'll be uh, it'll be an interesting design process and design challenge because it's something that I I have a good idea of what the outside of my watch should look like. At least the case design, I'm I'm still bouncing back and forth between a number of dial designs, uh, everything from something that's very very uh, very basic to um, more ornate designs. Uh, obviously, I'm an engine turner, so my my brain thinks about applying uh, guilloché patterns to to a watch dial. Um, but just because you can, again, just because you can do a thing, doesn't mean you should do a thing. And making a you know, one of the, the primary purposes of a watch is that it needs to be legible. It needs to be something that you can tell the time with. Some of these particularly ornate design ideas uh, for, for engine turning do not do not make a, a watch dial more legible. And so it's a it's an interesting balance of, of having something that 
that looks good and shows off my artistic design intent and is also a usable, you know, a functional watch. So you're thinking more than likely you'll be making your dials out of silver? I haven't decided on the materials I want to use in the long term. I know for the short term, my prototypes are going to be made out of silver. It, it's a material that I'm very comfortable with. I'm comfortable machining it. I'm comfortable engraving it. I have a, a lot of it around the shop just because I, you know, I use it for everything. So it, it's something that I'll, I will start with silver just because it's a relatively inexpensive material that, that's very nice to work with. I think long term, though, I'd like to use uh, Palladium 500 for things like cases. Uh, it's a beautiful white metal. It doesn't tarnish. It's significantly less expensive than platinum or white gold, but still you get the look of that. Uh, but it's also harder than silver. So there are a lot of advantages to something like Palladium 500. Uh, what I use for dials, I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to go with for dials. Uh, Palladium 500 is obviously an option for the dials. Again, it's a white metal that I can do a lot with. Traditionally, a lot of people use silver, fine silver. Uh, but again, fine silver, it will eventually tarnish. So I don't know that I'm I'm interested in necessarily going down that road. If I'm putting that much time and effort into, into making a dial, I don't know that I want it to tarnish on me. And do you happen to know offhand uh, whether the bleaching process that, uh, say, old Breguet's and Daniel's pieces are put through tarnishes in the same way that silver would normally it doesn't tarnish in the same way it does still tarnish though and um, so silver tarnish when you're looking at fine silver it tends to be uh, a light gray color and so the bleaching process uh, when the bleaching process that john's talking about you take the the dial uh, so if you look at something like a dial that uh, Roger Smith is doing today, for instance, he will make the dial, he will engrave it, he'll engine turn it, do all of the work that he needs to do on it, and then he will heat it and quench it in into uh, in a pickle solution, uh, a light acid solution, effectively, and that that bleaching process will turn it from a highly polished piece of metal to having a it, it gives it a matte finish i guess is the, the easy the best way of putting it is there's sort of a matte finish on the on the metal afterwards and it's uh it becomes a very white white color uh, but it doesn't reflect light the same way that a highly polished engraved piece will so with engine turning when you see engine turning right after it's been done you get a lot of reflection out of those cuts and it looks, you know, it catches the light, it catches the eye. Uh, after you bleach it, it becomes a matte finish and, and it doesn't catch the eye in quite the same way. And I, I'm not entirely a fan of, of bleached dials. Uh, I know why people are doing it and I know that it's a sort of a traditional finish, um, but I'm less a fan of that. I would rather see parts of a dial, uh, like let's say you've got a, a flat plane I would rather see, let's say it's around um, the numbers for the, the hours. Uh, I would rather see something like that be blasted and put a fine fine texture on it. And then the parts that are engine turned, I'd rather see those left as a bright polish. Uh, but that's a personal preference. Uh, it's an aesthetic choice. And uh, again, I can understand why Breguet and, and Roger Smith are doing that. It's, uh, you know, it's a very classic look and it's a very classic you know, designs, design choice. Yeah, the bead blast with engine turning is an aesthetic I, I would say I haven't seen before. You know, the reality is that I'm I am not I'm not a George Daniels, I'm not a Kerry Voodleinen, you know, I'm I am not going to or a you know Philippe Dufour, I am not going to be somebody who is going to make a you know significant technical watch. You know, I'm not going to be designing watch trains that are technically very challenging and impressive. And, and, you know, that's fine. There, there are guys out there who are doing that kind of thing and, and they're impressive, but I, that is not, you know, realistically, that is not the kind of work that I'm going to be doing. You know, that doesn't mean that I can't do interesting and different things with the aesthetic choices that I choose. Uh, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's changing up the way that a dial is done, using engine turning in ways that people aren't using engine turning. Uh, we've mentioned before with Vacheron Constantine, the uh, Metier d'Art, 
watch dials that they're doing. Some of them, they're doing innovative things with enamel work. Uh, some of the engine turning work they're doing on those is absolutely fabulous. And I love seeing people doing, you know, using engine turning in a very different way, create different textures with it. And that's that's more what I'm interested in doing in terms of innovation. I would rather use the techniques and the design ideas that I have that I've used in in pen making and that I've used in jewelry making bring those into watches and use different techniques than what the watch world is used to using and and try and stand out in that sense um, because you know again from a technical point of view I am not going to be you know I'm not going to make the next escapement technology like a, like a George Daniels right I'm not going to I'm not going to design something like that I, I it's unlikely that I'm ever going to be able to design a Grand Saunier you know and build that so you know I need to I need to have my watches stand out in some other way. So I'm going to try combinations of things that are, uh, that are a bit different than what people are used to using, but still look, you know, like a classic watch. I don't want it to be too, uh, too out there in terms of what the, uh, what the watch looks like either. And Palladium 500, it'll certainly be an, another way that you'll be able to have a more distinct uh, impact or, or look that's not entirely congruent with what's come before it, but is similar enough that you've got that shared heritage. Right. You know, something, uh, the white metals are very, very popular for watchmaking, especially right now. Uh, people love platinum watches. They love white gold, but there, there are challenges and limitations to those metals. Uh, one of them being the cost. They, they are very expensive to work in. Uh, something like a Palladium 500, uh, even, even in the jewelry world, there are not as many people using it as there probably should be, but there are some people doing some fabulous things with it. Uh, a uh, friend of the show, Chris Plouffe, he's doing some fabulous things with Palladium 500. Uh, he's doing some, uh, Dama or sorry, not Damascus with it. He's doing Mocha Megane with it. And it looks fabulous. It looks incredible in person. It photographs very well and it looks, it just looks great. Uh, it creates a great contrast with other, me other metals. Uh, using it with silver, for instance, in Mocha Megane, it, it just looks fabulous. He's doing some interesting things. He's inlaying gold, 24 karat gold into, into palladium 500. You know, there, there are certainly some, some innovative things that you can do with that metal that people are not used to. And so if I can bring some of that into the watch world, again, that, that allows me to distinguish what I'm doing, um, from the other boutique brands that are out there. So you may end up needing to change the name of your company from silver hand to palladium hand. <laughs> well, it's still a silver colored metal, right? It's uh yeah, I I don't think I'll ever leave the uh leave the silver world entirely. I it's uh there's certainly certainly advantages to it from a cost point of view. Again, making pens when you're dealing with uh 100 grams of silver in a in a pen. Uh, you know, if I were doing something like that out of platinum, for instance, you'd be looking at closer to 200 grams of of platinum with the cost of platinum these days. That's uh that becomes an expensive uh expensive pen very quickly. So yeah, I'll, I'll always I'll always continue to use silver, especially argentium. It's um it's a great metal to work in. It's it's very forgiving in a lot of ways, and it's um it's easy to cast and it doesn't tarnish very quickly. So there's there are a lot of advantages to it. But it's funny because they'll they're happy with stainless steel, uh, and they'll pay a, a premium for stainless steel. But uh, something like a silver, they're uh, I don't see a lot of watch cases being made out of silver anymore. So I think that uh, moving to Things like uh, like rose golds and and palladium five hundred and that kind of uh, that kind of metal is going to be important in my in my watch designs. All right, we'll have to come back to this once the movements actually arrive. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore Hand. <laughs>